Hello YouTubers and YouTuberettes. I'm going to try something new here. I have a friend at YouTube. He has a channel called UGK is Back. His name is Taylor and he started doing something a couple of weeks ago which has inspired me to try something in a similar vein. He does a daily vlog and the vlog might be something that's uh, well planned and well edited and uh, has lots of music in it and so on and other times it might be the mistakes that he's making as he's attempting to do something and something goes wrong. And while I will not try to do a daily vlog, I know that I'm just not the person who will schedule myself. Some days I will do videos and other days I won't. Most of my videos up to this point have been in categories such as piano chords, how to play piano chords, how to invest in the stock market, my garden, recipes and so on. But I will try doing some videos now and then. I will keep doing the videos that I have been doing. All that will stay as it has been in the past. I'll make uh, certain videos when I have the time to construct them carefully with editing. But I'm going to try some uh, videos that are not well edited necessarily and which uh, might end up being more entertaining as I uh, fumble my way through. And these would just be more or less conversational vlogs. In addition to uh, Taylor at UGK is back, another one of my YouTube friends, Neeks at Neeks TV, has a new series that he's beginning, and it's uh, episodes where he interviews people, and it's called Deep and Dirty Jersey. Uh, he lives in New Jersey, and so he's uh, doing things without scripts, things without a lot of planning going into them. And I also noticed uh, today that Sawyer Hartman, who's a popular YouTuber, has started up a daily vlog. Maybe a trend is developing here, I'm not sure. But as I say, I will not do a daily vlog, but it, I will be adding more videos. And they will be very random. They probably won't fit into categories. And this first one, I will tell at least two stories about the music business. And I know lots and lots of stories about the music business. I've been in the music business for more than 60 years. And I have some stories to tell that don't uh, fit into my piano chords uh, tutorials or my original songs and so on. So I will start right now with uh, some stories about the music business. And these are things you probably have never heard about. But now you're going to hear these stories. I'll begin by telling you a little bit about uh, when I first arrived in California, April 5th, 1956. I knew no one in California. I knew I wanted to get into show business, and I had no perceivable talent then, even less than what I have now. And I got a job. Uh, I arrived April 5th of 1956, and within a month I had a, a job, which was a good job for me. I was making $1.30 an hour dollar and 30 cents an hour at a warehouse and uh, 48 hours a week I was able to put some money aside and save up some money about a year later sometime 1957 I did start up a record company now I had uh, no musical ability then I could not play piano or guitar and I did not have any friends who had musical abilities so I did not put out any records right away but I was learning the business end of music with the record company. I learned about the State Board of Equalization and about the business licenses and so on and the tax situation with my own business. So I was not making any money but I was spending money. I was uh, spending money for the license and uh, spending money uh, buying things like tape recorders and reels of tape and so on. And I learned something in those days that uh, surprised me and that was that I could make a bit of a profit by losing money in a record company and that, that might sound stupid since I wasn't putting out any records but I was learning the business and I was spending money on things to do some recordings in the future and that was all deductible from my taxes so at the end of the year when I figured out my taxes for the IRS on the forms I would use a Schedule C which was a business um, tax form where I could deduct the cost of uh, a tape recorder, reels of tape, and so on. And I was able to get the things I needed to eventually have a record company. It, it would be five years before I actually got the record company uh, going to the point where I was releasing records. But uh, 
I had a tax deduction in the meantime. Now that led me into the jukebox arena because since I was working and making money at the warehouse, I had some money and savings. And I started looking for some sort of business I could get into where I could make some money without working real hard. And uh, that might uh, put me into show business. And I happened to be reading the Los Angeles Times one time, and here was a business opportunity, a jukebox route. And the jukebox route had eight jukeboxes in different restaurants and bars and one barber shop. And the fellow was selling the jukeboxes, the eight jukeboxes plus the service, for $2,000, which was a really low price uh, that came out to about $200 per jukebox plus $400 for the route that he had built up. And I learned something. Uh, I, I, by the way, I did not buy this business. I looked at it, though. And I learned something just by looking at it. The fellow took me around with him, a fellow who was selling the jukeboxes. And he says, okay, here's this jukebox here. You come in once a week. You empty the coin box. You divide half and half with the bar owner. Okay, that sounds reasonable. You make uh, uh, five, seven, eight, nine, ten dollars a night, maybe five dollars a night, whatever. And over a week, you make thirty-five, forty dollars, maybe more per jukebox, eight jukeboxes, and uh, so uh, say if you made $40 a, a week per jukebox, eight jukeboxes, $320, and you split it with the bartenders, 160 uh, a week, that's a lot of money. And then, of course, you'd pay for the maintenance on the jukebox and so on. So I thought, well, that uh, that's a pretty good deal, you know, $2,000, how can I go wrong? Even if I fix the jukeboxes and it costs some money now and then, I'm making some good money, plus... When I release records, I'll be able to put my records on the jukebox, and they'll play there, these places. People hear my records, and they'll go running out to buy my records because they'll be so good. So it seemed to make uh, pretty good sense, but then I learned a couple of things I did not know about. And the th first thing that uh, made me decide, no, I don't think I really want to get into this, the fellow told me the how you open up the jute box here, okay, and here's your coins, and you divide with the guy. And so I asked him, well, uh, how about playing the, the, the records? Uh, you know, they're going to wear out. Uh, how often do you change the records on the jute box? Do you go out and buy a new record when that record wears out there? And he said, no. He says, I never change the records. I says, well, that's how you mean you leave the same songs on? No, no, you don't leave the same songs on. There's a service that changes the records on the jukebox. And so you uh, agree with the service, you let them program the jukeboxes, and they would contact you, like I guess each week or every two weeks, whatever it was, and they would give you the records, say, okay, this goes on this jukebox, this goes on that jukebox, and they more or less rented space on your jukebox, but they all the spaces on the jukebox belong to the service and they would determine what records were played on the jukebox. And I I didn't have any say-so. And uh, I even asked him, well, what if a record wears out? Can I just go somewhere and buy a brand new copy of that same record and put it back on it? No, you can't touch the records on the jukebox. You can't change them. You can't alter the play. And if uh, the bartender's wife makes a record, you can't play that record on the jukebox. They, they had policy. Uh, well, that's uh, not the way I thought it worked. And so I started, by the way, the service paid, would, would have paid me something like uh, probably $5 a week per jukebox. And they programmed the jukebox. So I would be getting extra money. I could have made a lot of money with a jukebox service, but I would have no control whatsoever on what was played on them. All I would do would be go there like a little robot, pick up the money, and go home. I, I mean, it probably would have been better than working, but I needed the physical exercise, so I preferred working in the warehouse. And the thing I will tell you about the jukebox business then and the world of music now, it's the same thing. It's just technology has changed. 
There might not be jukeboxes in every bar or restaurant, but there is a way of music getting to the people. And whatever way the music gets to the people, that's controlled for the most part, with the exception of very independent artists and labels, which might use places like YouTube or uh, Facebook, whatever, to promote their music and to sell to the public through CD Baby or uh, iTunes or whatever. But if you want to be with the big uh, labels, the big companies or uh, whatever, there are people who control the music and the the jukebox services anywhere where there's a jukebox there will be someone collecting money and the way it works suppose i wanted to play put some elvis records on a jukebox well the elvis song is published so it's owned by the publishing rights are owned by bmi or ascap ascap or csac and i have to have a deal with bmi ascap or csac to play their music and if I don't have a deal with him, I've got to have a deal with a jukebox association. And it's very real that the owner of the jukebox doesn't necessarily have any say-so on what is played on that jukebox. I'll recommend two movies, Straight Outta Compton. That's a movie that came out in 2015, Straight Outta Compton. And the other movie is A Face in the Crowd. A Face in the Crowd is a 1957 movie. It's about the music business and what goes on what uh, what goes on when the cameras are turned off and the microphones turned off and how it's done and I will also t tell you two words here that uh, you might want to look up slotting fee s-l-o-t-t-i-n-g f-e-e -E, slotting fee the way the music business is run by the way that's very legal for a music service company, which might be Joe's Music Service or the Downtown Music Service or whatever. It's very much uh, a legal thing that uh, companies can do. They can own the rights, the space, the slot on your jukebox. And you give them that right or that space. And if you don't sell to them, your jukebox might wind up in an alley somewhere. Uh, they might not hurt you, but uh, you're going some time to change the records on your jukebox, and your jukebox won't be there. Um, and that uh, you can sort of see a reference to that in the movie uh, "The Girl Can't Help It" with Tom Yule. I think that's at YouTube. Um, but that's my jukebox story. There's a lot more to the story than that, but that's a, a basic idea and the the word slotting fee usually that's used for people who want to uh, sell their product at a supermarket say if you let's say your mom makes great bread just the greatest bread in the world and you think oh boy i'll just package up this bread i'll take it down to the supermarket we'll put it on the shelves people will taste this bread this is going to be the biggest thing that ever happened so you go to the supermarket and you say hey i want to put my mom's bread here on this shelf right beside your bread and uh, we've got real nice wrappers, a nice logo on the wrappers. And we'll split with you 50-50, whatever uh, you sell it for. You keep half, we'll keep half. And the supermarket's going to say, well, that's nice. Uh, let's discuss the slotting fee. So look up slotting fee, find out what that is. But the other thing I'll tell you is similar. The other story, uh, it has to do with money in the music business and what is legal and what is not. Now, many of you probably have heard of payola. Payola, there was a payola scandal, late 50s. Look up payola scandal. DJs in the late 1950s, some of them were investigated by Congress and they found out that DJs had been accepting money from record companies to play their records. And by the way, the, what I was saying about the jukeboxes, the services, the services that would have paid me for the space on my jute box, they were collecting money from the record companies to put their records on my jute boxes. So that's how that works. But uh, the payola scandal came along and some DJs were ruined. Their careers were over because they took payola. They were paid to play this music that they were playing. And the record company was just uh, 
to, oh, this is terrible. We shouldn't pay people. You know, it's so illegal. So after the payola scandal, payola was considered to be illegal. You can't do that. DJ cannot accept money to pay a record. So I was at a radio station in Las Vegas. I was working weekends. I was not a, a weekday jock. I, I worked at a warehouse during the week, and I worked at radio on weekends. And this one station I worked at, which shall go unnamed, but the first initial is K, the station played country music. Well, there was a big hit record came along. I mean, a really big hit. It was number one on the country charts for several weeks, but it also was number one on the pop charts for several weeks. It was a really big, multi-million selling single. And the person who made that recording, he called up the music director at this station at which I worked, and he thanked them for playing the record. By the way, Las Vegas was considered to be an influential market for radio since there were people visiting Las Vegas from every state, every big city. When a record was played at a station in Las Vegas, people from all over heard about it. And if a record was sensational in Las Vegas, it would soon be a sensation across the country. Las Vegas was a market that broke the big records. Um, but anyway, this person who had the big number one single, the singer, called up the station in which I worked, and he talked to the music director, and he said, well, uh, thank you very much for playing that record. That uh, really was a big hit for me. It was really wonderful, and I got this brand new record out, and I remember the brand new record that he had out, and the station had played it a few times, but the record just was not good it just wasn't it, it didn't have it but the person who made the record told the music director at the radio station he said you know if that new record of mine happens to be number one at your station if it becomes number one at your station i'm going to buy all your djs a brand new suit of clothes now, that would not have included me because I was a weekend announcer and they had the weekday lineup and they had the weekend lineup. But anyway, sure enough, that record became number one at that station. And sure enough, every one of the weekday DJs got a brand new suit of clothes with the logo of the station embroidered on the suit of clothes. And the record was terrible. And the record did not catch on nationally at failed. But those would be my first two stories I'll tell you for uh, vlogging. Uh, I, I will tell other musical stories, but I'll tell a lot of other different kinds of stories also. But uh, for the people who are planning on getting into the music business, I will tell you that the way to get, make money in the music business is to focus on the business, not the music. If you know what you're doing and you know how to shake hands uh, when the microphone's turned off and all that. Uh, you don't have to do anything illegal. By the way, the guy who says, if, if, you, if this record becomes number one on your station, I'll be so happy I'll buy everyone a new suit of clothes. He did not do anything illegal. He didn't say, I will pay you to play my record. He's, he's just going to be so happy if it happened to be number one. So... That's part of the business of music, and whatever goes on today, it's the same mentality back behind the scenes. Uh, there are a lot of people in the music business who don't know beans about music. They couldn't play any kind of instrument or hum a tune in most cases. And the same is true, that it's slightly different here. I'll just add one more little sentence. that On any board of directors, look, look at any financial site look at any company that you know something about, like whether it's Ford Motor Company or whether it's Microsoft, or whatever, and look at the people who are on the board of directors. Chances are if it's a car company, they don't know the first thing about building a car, but they're on the board of directors. And the reason they are on that board of directors is because they know how to run a company. They know business. So if you want to get into the music business, know about the business.
and it helps if you know something about music but better know about the business. And 